your commentator is Ray Henley. Great events in the Pacific race into history. A vast armada of troop ships, guarded by the largest naval striking force ever assembled, sails to the attack. Destination, the Marshall Islands. For 25 consecutive days, the Marshalls are ripped by Army liberators operating from Tarawa, softening up Jap defenses and destroying landing strips. Black tracers reach up like flaming fingers to seize the bombers, but fail to get the range. Jap planes on the ground are hammered into wreckage on the smashed runway. The roar of tons of high explosives from the sky is only the prelude to the mighty symphony of destruction to come. Now the Navy goes into action. For 28 hours, the Japs are hammered by the most concentrated naval pounding in history. An estimated 14,000 tons of shells are poured on Poisjolaine, Roy, and Namur. Battleships and cruisers move up to within a few thousand yards and let the Japs have it. They're on the target. Empty shell cases, the work of just one gun crew. Now the word is passed to man the landing boat while the Navy continues a crushing bombardment. Marine veterans of Jap smashing victories in the Solomon and Army veterans of the storming of Aptu shove off from transports, 30,000 strong, determined to shorten the road to Tokyo. Under an umbrella of steel from the fleet, landing boats manned by Coast Guardsmen begin to assemble for the storming of the beaches. Tossed by the long Pacific swell, the boats maneuver for position as the barrage continues. The Japs have been fortifying the marshals for 20 years, and in 20 hours, the Navy's big guns rip apart everything the Army bombers miss. It's a grim show, and some of it is bombing by carrier planes dominating the sky. Now the landing boats are churning into the beach with Leathernecks of the 4th Division. Soon sending the familiar word, the Marines have landed and have the situation well in hand. But there are Japs still ready to give battle as snipers' bullets whine over the beachhead. Inland, all over the shell-smashed islands, enemy pockets must be cleaned out. Men of the 7th Army Division hit the beach on Kwajalein with the cool discipline of a practice maneuver. On timetable schedule, landing ships and more troops come in. Advancing troops are warned by a sniper's bullet. Japs still try to put up a futile resistance, but once they are located, the war is soon over for them. These men sight a sniper in a tree. A company of Japs tries to escape by swimming across the lagoon, and they are kept underwater permanently. A deadly mortar goes into action. No organized resistance remains now, but isolated groups of survivors make a desperate effort to fight on as the Americans mop up. Although obviously doomed, they dig into wrecked pillboxes. Sometimes it's necessary to use TNT persuaders 
and they are very effective. Cameramen on the firing line get a battle action picture as fighting flares up in another sector. Once palm hooded and lush green, the place is withered and torn by the smashing bombardment. Hidden in slit trenches and the shattered ruins of concrete and steel pillboxes, frantic Japs continue to give battle to the advancing Yanks. sears a nest of screaming snipers. Their hiding place is reduced to rubble and ashes. The enemy is stunned by the terrific force of an attack that sends a chill through every extended artery of the uncivilized nation, all the way to its black heart in Tokyo. The word is passed to take prisoners, and commands in the Japanese language are given through a loudspeaker to a group of the enemy hidden in a blasted pillbox. It's significant that here in the marshals, the supposedly fatalistic Jap soldiers jump for the chance to live when given. They are ordered to come out, and out they come. Prisoners are stunned and dazed by the relentless land, sea, and sky fire to which they were exposed. These Yanks are taking no chances with Jap treachery. They mean business. But the sons of the setting sun are treated like human beings in spite of their black record. An intelligent officer questions prisoners. They are tagged, then transferred to ships offshore. The cost of victory, 1,100 Americans are wounded and 286 killed. A thousand Japs are taken prisoner, the largest number to surrender in any campaign up to this time. As speedily as possible, injured Americans are taken to hospital ships offshore. Scenes of destruction tell eloquently why the Jap Air Force never got into action here. The bare skeleton of a hangar, wrecked zeros on the ground, devastation, they all tell of the offensive might that swiftly conquers the first Japanese territory invaded. But somehow, a supply of Jap fear escapes destruction. Headquarters of the Japanese command takes a terrific beating. Comrades pay tribute to those who have made the supreme sacrifice. The smoke of battle lifts to reveal our flag flying above the marshals. Admiral Chester Nimitz, Supreme Naval Commander in the Pacific, salutes a great victory that smashes closer to the heart of Japan when the Yanks invade the marshals.